everyone. Um, my name is Lewis Robinson. I'm the uh, programming manager at the Portland Public Library. And uh, this is a Portland Public Library spotlight event. Uh, really excited to have Lily King and Susan Conley with us here tonight. Um, just wanted to point out a few logistical details. Um, you've all been admitted to the meeting on mute, and we'd love for you to just stay that way throughout the um, duration of the talk. Um, and um, you'll have a chance to ask questions through the chat feature. Um, so just type your questions at any time um, during the hour, and I will pass those questions along to Lily and Susan. Um, I'm joined with joined by Sarah Skowinski, who's the literature and language librarian um, at the Portland Public Library. Uh, and um, why don't we get get started right away? I'll introduce these two uh, terrific writers um, and then just mute myself and uh, and listen to them converse. So Lily King uh, is the author of five award winning novels, her most recent novel, Writers and Lovers was published in early March, and her 2014 novel, Euphoria, won the Kirkus Award, the New England Book Award, the Maine Fiction Award, and was a finalist for the National Book Critics Award. Euphoria was named one of the 10 best books of 2014 by the New York Times Book Review. It was included in Time's top 10 fiction books of 2014, as well as on Amazon, NPR, Entertainment Weekly, Publishers Weekly, and Salon's best books of 2014. And her good friend Susan Conley is the author of the novel Paris Was the Place and The Foremost Good Fortune, a book that won the Maine Literary Award for Memoir. Her most recent novel, Elsie Come Home, was published in January 2019. Born and raised in Maine, her writing has appeared in the New York Times Magazine, the Paris Review, and Plowshares. She's been awarded fellowships from the McDowell Colony uh, and many other places. Um, oh, uh, reason uh, someone no. was trying to share their screen. Um, so here they are. And also I wanted to point out that um, on the chat, um, folks can just chat directly with me. I'm hoping that you can see the link that I've put in there to Longfellow Books, which um, they are standing, standing by to take your online orders. Um, so just submit them via that link if you can. Um, of course, you can also call them during the day. Um, or just uh, order through their website, but that link goes directly to Longfellow Books, who's our sponsor for the Spotlight event. Uh, so here are Lily and Susan. Mm -hmm. Hi, Sus. Hi, Lil. <laughs> Thank you, Lewis. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Yeah. Um, Thank you, wonderful Portland Public Library, um, who believes in supporting writers and celebrating authors like this. So we love you, Portland Public Library. Um, Lily, I am very excited to talk to you about your novel tonight. <laughs> um, I think it's pretty cool to be talking about your beautiful novel, um, which is a book in part about writing a novel. And we're at a, we're at a virtual library. So I think it's kind of cool. Yeah, and we're, we're in the same writers group and so you saw that you watched me do the whole thing and saw a very early draft of the book and you've been through the whole writing process with me which is kind of wild <laughs> i know it's such a treat and so fun it's always fun when the books arrive and we hold them um the book the beautiful book here we are the beautiful book um writers and lovers um so <laughs> this is such a funny, <laughs> it's a funny medium where sometimes people that was a student of ours from our Italy retreat, which I just absolutely loved. But we'll carrying on, moving on. <laughs> and I have um, I think today I was thinking we have had a conversation going about books our entire friendship. So I think at least twenty five years. Um, and um, this book lives on so many levels. <laughs> um, and uh, I think there's an audio thing. I think there's a sharing screen maybe issue going on. Or, <laughs> okay. Um, so this book is about romantic love. It's about steering grief. It's about sibling love. It's about so many, so many things. But I thought maybe tonight we would pull on the thread of um, the, the writing life, 
Mm. And um, what it means that Casey, who is the um, main character of this novel, is trying to become a, a writer. Um, she's a woman and she's a writer. And I wondered if you had any initial um, conception of who Casey would be, Lil, when you started the book, and if she would be um, a writer. Yes, I, I, I knew that writing was the central feature um, from the initial moment of conception of this book. I knew it was about a writer. Um, I didn't really know a whole lot more than that, you know. Um, everything else kind of came. I mean, I, I feel like this way with most of my books. I, I learn about my characters as they go along. I learn about their personality. Um, you know, by the end of the draft, I have a, a fairly good sense of who they are. And then it's just a question of um, uh, shaping them a little bit more and, and kind of, you know, more emphasizing who they are and, and getting that a little, you know, richer and deeper. Um, but it really is sort of a, an exploration for me um, the first time through. So I, Casey herself wasn't really, really fixed in my mind. But I did know that she was going to have a number of problems and a number of challenges. And this incredible um, doubt, you know, and a sense of fear and a fear of failure, you know, very similar to what I felt when I was writing my first novel. You know, I really... I really wanted to kind of tap into those emotions of that time in my life that, um, that, that were really, really some of the hardest years of my life, you know? And, uh, and so I knew, I knew those things, but then the rest was sort of an exploration. Hmm. I, I'm guessing we have a, um, a, a lot of writers listening. There's so many people, um, listening to you and, and tonight. And um, I, I have that in mind a little bit um, with my questions, but um, one of the things I love about the book is the war of, well, I don't love the war of attrition of the writers, but I think you do it so well. But by the end, um, Casey only has one friend who's mm -hmm. writing, Muriel, mm -hmm. and the others, you know, to quote her, have, have given up. Um, and um, I wanted to ask you, what do you think are the crucial reasons why Casey doesn't give up writing? I think it goes back to that, that, that line on the third page, you know, where she says, um, I don't write because I have something to say. I write because if I don't write, I will feel even worse. You know, it's almost, it, it's really a kind of a biological psychological thing for her it's like running you know it's like exercise it's like breathing almost like she has to do it to feel good about herself and um and i think people who don't you know who that is not true for they they can choose to make really wise practical decisions to have you know a secure fixed income um and then there are people who just uh, can't, you know, will never choose that because they would feel like some part of themselves would die forever. And I, she's just one of those people and Muriel is too. And the two, three men that, you know, Casey gets involved with, they are like that too. You know, just people who, who just refuse to let that part of them die. Hmm. Hmm. So well said. Um, she, Casey, has this incredible honesty and self-deprecation, I think. She's also really steely um, and wickedly funny and open-hearted. Um, and she knows that um, some people feel that she has made um, or can make her feel crazy for her life choices um, in terms of pursuing her art. There's this moment where she says that nearly every guy she's dated believed they should already be famous, believed that greatness was their destiny, and they were already behind schedule. Um, I love that line. And I wanted to just kind of jump into that, um, to the heart of the matter there, if we could, um, around, okay, it's 1997, we're in Cambridge. Um, the men think they're destined for greatness. Why don't the women? Why, why not, Casey? Why, why not? <laughs> well, I think it's very much a, 
cultural um, issue that, that, and I think, it, you know, it still holds true today and it has tro hold, held true for centuries that, that men are really raised to believe that they can, you know, do anything if they put their mind to it and that um, they can have a life of greatness. And, uh, and that is, those doors will open for them if they put their mind to it. And women aren't raised with that. I think now our generation of children that we're raising, I do think that those, those doors are opening and that, that mental um, concept is, is getting to them, you know, that, that, that women can be ambitious and not be ashamed of it and not feel like they're breaking all kinds of cultural codes and boundaries and expectations to, to, to be that way. And it's funny because, you know, we were, we were raised in, you know, in the middle of the women's liberation movement. And you would think that that would be Casey's, you know, feeling, but I, I know for myself that that wasn't true. I, I had felt a lot of shame for my ambition and I never would have ever had the nerve or the audacity or even the self confidence to say that I was ambitious. You know, I don't even know if I would say it now. I mean, I think I'd feel more comfortable saying it now, but that the idea of ambition isn't even in her lexicon at, at this point, you know, she's just, she's just trying to stay sane really you know she's trying to stay afloat um emotionally and psychologically and uh and i i i do think that like i looked at little boys you know when my kids were young you know there's a lot of bravado and there's lots of bragging you know like it's definitely you know there's a lot of kind of fake it till you make it kind of attitude um with you know in I think it, you know more so for for boys than girls I just I, I don't know why that is but I think there are things in our culture that that allows for it um well I had just finished and we've been talking about this um a little bit this week Lily and I about Rebecca Solnit's memoir um on becoming a writer and um specifically on becoming a feminist writer and she has this great line in the book. Um, she had a long, hard road to becoming a writer. And just like Casey, she didn't have a lot of money. She hustled her day jobs. She has this line. She keeps repeating it throughout the whole book. It's not you. It's the patriarchy. <laughs> um, and it was really instructive for me to be reading that and thinking about this talk and really yeah. um, spending a lot of time with Casey. Because um, I feel like that phrase kind of echoes over the book. Um, your book. Um, and I think Casey's really strong. Um, and she keeps silencing in her head those people like Adam, her landlord, who tell her that um, they're amazed she has anything to say. Um, and I wondered if you were conscious, and this is kind of like a part two to my earlier question, but were you pleased or surprised? Did she surprise you when she started indicting the kind of white male canon? <laughs> yeah. You know, I think, you know, when you're writing a first draft, there's so much going on. You know, I'm trying to get her from the driveway into her potting shed, right? <laughs> With the dog. And she's, the dog's on the leash and the dog's got to go back in the main house and she's got to pass through her landlord. Like, I am so not thinking about the patriarchy and I'm not thinking about, you know, the themes of the book or anything like that on the first draft um, through. And, and so afterwards I can kind of see, you know, what, what I'm doing, but honestly, I, I'm really, I'm concentrating on, on the arc of the story and, um, and all the, you know, the sentences and the details and the everything and trying to make it just feel real and feel like a real experience to the reader. I mean, that's my whole objective and, and, um, I'm, I'm, I'm not thinking about themes really. I, I, the themes come when people read it. And I mean, I, I, some of the themes come sooner and, 
uh, and then, and then when people read it, then I start to, you know, see, oh, that connects with that. And that connects with that. I'm not doing all of that right away. You know, uh, I, I always say that I'm like a worm on the ground, you know, like I'm just crawling my way, like instinctively and I'm not, it's not a cerebral, um, process in that way. Uh, but when I look back on it now, you know, I see everything that she was battling and I, I, it, it does seem like, um, you know, it's almost like a DCS or something, you know, like, like going through one, one sort of trial after the other, like she goes to the male gynecologist and she goes to the male dermatologist and she goes, you know, I mean, there's just, there's the male chef and there, like, there are a lot of, um, a, a lot of uh, conflicts that, that arise and, and it does seem gendered, you know? And that was not, that was not my intention, but it was friggin' life in the nineties. Like I, I felt like I was, you know, time trying to channel my own experiences and my own experiences have been extremely gendered. And, and I, I have faced, I feel, I mean, like all women, we have faced a lot of belittlement and um, uh, bias and misogyny, we, you know, on a very, very regular basis. And I know it's a tired subject and everyone's tired of hearing about it, but it's true. <laughs> <laughs> well, Casey's, I mean, Casey's living it and you do it so well. So we have to talk about it. Um, this fall, I, this rising and falling barometer of her belief in herself is so well done, her belief in herself mm -hmm. as a writer. So on certain days, she's utterly committed to the novel. And then other days she feels like she's wasting her life. And I think so many artists feel that way about their art, whatever medium they're in, right? And yes. so much of it is about how you harness your confidence. And um, I love this line, some days her writing looks like a long stream of words, like someone with a disease that involves delusions has written them. Um, and I thought that was a great, great line. And I wondered, Lil, this is sort of a bigger question. And then maybe you could even take us to a passage and do a little reading. But um, do you, does your own writing ever look to you like a delusion? Um, and um, can, you, can you try to describe what drives you as a writer? Like, is it emotional curiosity? Is it language? <laughs> like, um. Yeah, I mean, my my does my own writing ever look like a delusion? Sorry, you, you blanked out there for a second. Yeah, that was the first one. Yeah, delusion. Okay. Um, yes, I mean, you know, the the every single novel, it, it, it's kind of sad that you don't like build confidence with every novel. I mean, I, I you know, I don't know if you feel this way, but every novel is its own puzzle, it's its own problem, and you start at the bottom of the hill, you know, with the big boulder and you're trying to go up the hill and it just feels as heavy and as hard every single time you know because it's new and fresh and you've never seen these problems before these characters and so um you know you have really e e occasional i have occasional good days where it just feels like i i, I that's what i wanted to do and i did it and then a lot a lot a lot of days um where i write but I don't feel like I'm really getting anywhere. But that's where the delusion comes in because I am getting somewhere. And that's the only thing that experience has helped me with is to kind of ignore those emotions. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I always feel this way. I, you know, um, and I, I think that's the biggest challenge as a, as a, any kind of artist is, is to really put the doubt and the fear aside and just do your work and, and not have emotions about it, you know? Just, just do your work. <laughs> um, and so, and uh, to answer the next question, um, I feel that my <clears throat> objective is, is to create an experience for the reader. You know, the kind of experience that I like to read, you know, when I read a novel. And so I'm really, I am just trying to write the novels that, that I would like to read. Um, and with the, the, in the kind of way that, that, that I like, you know, a story to be delivered to me. Um, and I, I am, I'm using all of the elements, you know, language and dialogue and, 
everything, every, every single element of writing to try to create that experience as, as best I, as I possibly can, you know? And so, so the reader feels like they, um, they went somewhere emotionally and they feel maybe hopefully connected in some way to these characters and what's happened. And, and, and hopefully it, you know, it reverberates with, with their life experiences in some way and makes them feel less alone. I mean, I, I really feel like that is, that is a big objective is to connect, you know, as, as Ian Forrester said, just connect. I, I do feel like that, that is absolutely my goal. And the only reason I really know that is when I feel that from readers, when somebody writes me and says specifically how they connected, it is the most satisfying feeling ever, you know? And so I realize, oh, you know, that's really why I do this. So I can have that connection and they can have that connection and we can feel as one, you know? Mm. This feels like a great time for you to read that passage we were talking about. Okay. Well, you did. I, I'm going to end on the same passage that you just read, but well, I'll set that up, you know, a little bit so people can kind of understand it. So this, this happens kind of deep into the novel on page 230, um, but it doesn't, doesn't ruin anything at all. She is on a date with one of her lovers, uh, Oscar, and he is a successful writer. He's a good how old, 15 years older than she is and um he's on he's written his third novel and or his third book i believe uh, i think two novels and a short story collection um and he has a reading he has a book out and he's semi successful se you know successful semi famous you know he would like to be a lot more famous um but he's quite well known in the boston area so uh the the books the it's the Wellesley bookstore which is funny because I have a reading at Wellesley bookstore virtual reading reading next week so um, or no yes next week no maybe the week after anyway we get to the bookstore a half hour before the reading Oscar tells the girl to register his name and she doesn't recognize it and doesn't know about the reading she points us to a woman in back who flushes when she sees Oscar. She says it's an honor to have him and she takes us to an alcove where there are rows of seats for his reading and a table with stacks of his three books on it. Two people are sitting in the back row already knitting. The bookstore owner says that the writer Vera Wilde is coming to the reading and to dinner afterwards. I hope that's all right, she says. It'll be good to see her, Oscar says. Oh, phew, she said you were old friends. We hosted her at the church last week. She shows us to a room in back of boxes of books and a desk covered with paperwork. There are two plastic molded chairs in the middle. You can put your stuff in here and just relax until seven. Can I get you a glass of water? No, I think we'll have a walk, Oscar says, and heads to the door. I thank the woman and catch up with him on the street. So you have to understand that, you know, Casey is still writing her first novel. She hasn't even finished her first novel. Like Oscar is living the life that she wants really badly. So I just have to say that. Because, you know, we've had 30, 230 pages that have told us that. Um, I think, the, okay, he points to, he points back to the bookstore. Did you see that pathetic Xerox they taped on the door? Vera Wilde fills the church. I get six chairs and a music stand they nicked from the high school band practice. Fuck. There were at least 20 chairs there, maybe 30. I am 47 years old. I was supposed to be reading in auditoriums by now. Did you see the cover of the book review last week? That was my student. My students are blowing by me. I'm not doing this. I always think it'll be okay, but it's not okay. I thought you were 45. I know I have a better book inside me. I have something big inside me. I just, ever since, fuck, it almost seems like he's going to punch the bricks of the gift shop beside us. Instead, he lays his palms on the wall and lets out some jagged breaths. Nearly every guy I've dated, believe they should already be famous, believe that greatness was their destiny and they were already behind schedule. An early moment of intimacy often involved a confession of this sort, a childhood vision, teacher's prophecy, a genius IQ. At first, with my, with my boyfriend in college, I believed it too. Later, I thought I was just choosing delusional men. Now I understand it's how boys are raised to think, how they are lured into adulthood. I've met ambitious women, driven women, but no woman has ever told me that greatness was her destiny. So, mm. ah. <laughs> it reinforces the points that I was making. 
It's so good. It's so fun. Her voice is so strong and clear. Oh, oh that makes me wonder, did, did you sometimes have fun writing the novel? Did you have when you would land you know, on things like that? I want that to be so true. You know, I, people ask me that a lot because, you know, there's humor in it and everything. And it seems like, oh, the writer must be having fun. But first of all, I have no idea what's going to be funny to other people. You know, I, I, I don't know. Again, like I'm thinking about so many other things and uh, have so many other worries about, you know, um, I, I, I just don't remember fun. I want to say yes, yes, but I don't. Do you, no, you have days of fun? Do you, you know, did you, did you have fun writing your last novel? <laughs> <laughs> I know it's a very loaded question. It is. Um, no, okay. I'm, I'm asking seriously. Uh, okay, I just, the novel that I just finished that's coming out next year, I yeah. do realize was much less, it took less of my pounds of flesh. Then Elsie come home. I did. It, it, I mean, I'm not going to say it was just a brief, it was just a, you know, a, a lot of hilarity, but I do sort of feel like, oh, that one was maybe there was more humor in the book. So maybe it was mm -hmm. a little more fun to, you're so good on dialogue. I mean, your dialogue, well, when it, it gets into these rhythms where it just takes over and the, we're, we're in this beautiful prose dream and, um, that's where you just feel like, oh my God, she must be, at a certain point, you kind of give, give over to dialogue like that, I would imagine, and let it, just let it go. And something magical is happening then. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Again, it doesn't seem magical, but, um, you know, I don't know. I, I feel like I just never know what, if, if anybody's going to understand what I'm saying. I honestly feel like I'm speaking a different language, you know, a, a language that's never been spoken before. And who knows if anybody is going to be able to translate it, you know, in their head. I just, I, it's funny. I, I, um, I, I don't know. But obviously when it stays on the page, you know, somehow it stays there. So, so I, I haven't X'd it out and that's all I can do is like, all right, well, <laughs> that's the best I can do. Mm, mm. Um, Lil, I was thinking about if Casey was, um, if, if she was alive, if she was 31 now in 2020, um, mm. and she was trying to decide to finish that book, like so many young women we know, um, yeah. what would you say to her? What kind of things would you say to her about not, about not giving up? I would just say, don't give up. I, I mean, just keep at it. Just keep at it. Don't give up. Don't let that part of yourself die, you know? Um, just, I, I don't know. I mean, there's so really in the end, in terms of encouragement for writers, there's so, there's just that to say, like sit in the chair and do the work, mm. you know, and, and don't, um, don't let your doubts and your fears consume you, you know, don't, just don't, don't let them drive your decisions, you know, do what you can to keep writing, mm. you know? Yeah, that's, that's really good. I'm always um, amazed at when fear is let into the room, you know, if you're even in a writing workshop, if, if somehow we let fear into the room and suddenly um, the sensor is on everyone's shoulder and how you have to banish that sensor. Yes, exactly. You really do. And then it gets much better. It really, if you really can just stop judging it. Um, yeah, I was, I was with a, um, stu some students the other um, evening in a, in a workshop and this beautiful word allow was used instead of, instead of judging and saying, we, we decided like, let's not say, oh, that's good or oh, that's not good. Let's just allow the writing to be, right? Mm -hmm. mm, that's yeah. very good. That's very yeah. good. Another, another kind of more practical thing that I would say, which I've learned over the years, it's been hard because I started out as a short story writer. And when you write short stories, you can, every day you can start by starting at the beginning of the short story and making little edits and then carrying on. But with a novel, you cannot do that. And I, I, I really think that's a real trap to go back and try to edit before you have a full draft. I just push through, I do not look back. I just do not look back unless I need to look back to find out a character's name or you know something, some detail. 
But I just look at the couple of lines that I wrote, the last things I wrote the day before, and I just keep going. And that is, I, I don't write very fast, but that has saved me a lot of time. And, and it scares me when people go back and think, oh, if I just, if I just get the beginning just right, you know, that's real perfectionist behavior. And you cannot be a perfectionist if you're a novelist. You can't. You can be a perfectionist if you're a short story writer and you write a short story a year, you know, but if you're going to write novels, you cannot waste your time like that. <laughs> I feel so strongly about that. <laughs> oh, it's so true. I, 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 I've had these experiences. I know or I've, I've called you and I've said, I looked back today. I looked back. <laughs> That's true. When the day is just ruined and you're stuck on page 13 and you really want to be on page 250. Oh, it's the worst. So funny. It's like Orpheus and Eridici, you know, like, you know, you just can't look back. Do not, do not. Oh God. Out of Hades. <laughs> um, all right. So this seems to be getting us a little into process, which I know is sometimes fun to talk about for people. Mm -hmm. um, and I know you're, I know a lot about your process. You but I would, do. I, I know it by heart. You could speak <laughs> to it. Um, it's a great process. And I, I have had the experience lately of having some people be writing by hand and enjoying it so much, some students. Mm, and oh, I, cool. So maybe you can speak to the power of, of your notebooks and things. Well, I just happen to have my notebook <laughs> here. This is my first notebook from Writers and Lovers. Um, I always write by hand um, my first draft and I always write on, you know, an aligned notebook. Um, with a spiral because that's how I did it in high school. My high school English teacher is on this um, Zoom event Yay. thing. I saw him. I love that. Hi, Tony. This makes me so happy and so really so thrilled. Um, I could, oh my God, there he is. There he is. Anyway, he taught me um, creative writing when I was in high school. He, he had two creative writing classes. Um, that I took my junior year, one semester junior, one semester senior year. And, uh, and we had to write a short story, a three and a half page short story. Um, every Monday, we had to have it on his desk. Uh, and so, you know, that was a lot of short stories over the course of a high school semester. Um, I always wrote them, you know, by hand, spiral notebook lined paper, narrow ruled, you know, the whole thing. So that's how I got my habit and I've never really stopped. Um, and uh, I, usually I just get a handful of ideas and I start in and then I keep notes in the back. I have a little section in the back of my, of every notebook for, for notes and then, and then usually like at some point I'll write like a timeline. And so this is just, a yeah, timeline is usually just, it, it's not all the events by any means. It's just little ideas that I have where I can, you know, kind of uh, little kind of signposts to, to help me get where I'm going. Although often I don't, I don't actually get there. <laughs> I go, I turn around and, and go back. Um, now I've lost Sue's. I don't know. Have you? Can you guys, can everybody see everybody? I can hear you and see you. Okay. Oh, there you are. Okay. There you are. Okay, good. Hi. Okay. Okay. And so then, and then I, you know, I, I write in my notebook and then I type it on the computer and that's really the first revision that happens. The first of many, many revisions, but getting it from, uh, this is where, this is, this is my allow notebook. If we use that language, you know, I allow myself to do anything in pencil, anything at all. Like I try not to have the critic at all in the room and it's just creative and whatever comes down comes down because i know that i'm going to be typing it up and i'll be that's when i'll have my editor hat on and my creative hat on at the same time kind of getting it onto the computer in this kind of fusion draft of like writing and also editing and i love that like that is like the sweet spot when i have this rough draft you know written by hand and i get it onto the computer and um that's when it, it, it feels, it, it, it starts to feel more like, you know, a novel. Hmm. Yeah, I think the power of the first draft cannot be overstated, right? The, the, then you have the clay and you're sort of, um, yeah. you're, you're just in this free fall until you have that first draft. Um, 
so it's really powerful what you're saying about your, your um, free, free license to try anything with that pencil. I love that. I love that. Hmm. Yeah. And I have to say that like, you know, for the writers out there, that, that moment when you're about two thirds of the way through a first draft is really a killer. I mean, it just, you just, that's when, all, for me anyway, that's when the doubts really set in, you know, you've, you, you, you've gotten past the beginning and you're into the middle and you cannot see your way out. And, and, and that's a very, very hard stage. That's when I always call up Suze and I'm like, I'm gonna quit this one. And I, both she and my husband always remind me that I say this every single time and that I'm actually not going to quit it. And then I don't, but every time. I always feel like I'm going to, I always every feel time. like, yeah. And I, we, I always have to really ask myself privately, is she, is she serious this time? What, <laughs> what am I going to do? Because I have to convince her that she should keep going, but I have to use different strategies this time. So a lot of my work is just to be super nonchalant. Like she'll tell me and I'll be like, oh really? Oh really? And I'll sort of pretend I haven't even really heard her. Oh, that's too bad. Dude, you're not gonna continue that novel. What are you having for dinner? So there's a lot of that. Oh, oh and the other thing that we, we do a lot is, um, and I just wanted to state this because it's, it's when you get into that last third of the novel is, Oh my God, I, I have called you on several occasions and you, you, me, and said like, I have written myself into a plot that I cannot get out of. Like I'm so yeah. confined by my plot now. And as if we're surprised when we have written the book, but it's just shocking. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, I, yeah, you just kind of knit and you knit and you knit yourself into this little corner. And then you're like, uh, you know, well, I can't unravel it all. I mean, you know, it, it's just very tricky. Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a hard hard part. And it's funny because you and I had that writers retreat in Kittery Point, um, where we both like we were in this big house and we each had our kind of separate domains of writing. And then we'd see each other at the end of the day for a walk and and a meal. And that's when I was writing the end of this book, like the last probably. 40 pages were written like in a fury in that in that house so that was that was really great so you were there when I broke through you know to the rest of the novel which I remember great. that it was really good it's really exciting um a few other things before we go to questions right. um I, I was thinking of a three-legged stool or maybe there's more legs on this stool but I just wanted to talk about how well you do work and Casey is a really good waitress, in my opinion. I mean, she does get fired, but I think she's damn good. <laughs> uh, and so I always am talking to um, students about the idea that we, you really have to have this fully rounded human life on the page, right, in, in your fiction. And, and what, uh, what is the work? How, how is she supporting this art? And she's working damn, damn hard. And then the other leg is this deeply, deeply moving account of the mother's death mm. and um, this like full accounting of the mother and the love for the mother. And uh, I think you also, you just take my breath away with those passages oh, about um, the mother. Um, so I just wanted to sort of put that out there. Like there's work, there's always work to be cared, you know, taking care of. And then there's always, in my opinion, the mother, like really taking care of the story of the mother and, that's such mm. an important story in this book. Mm. Yeah, I never, I wouldn't have ever written this book if my own mother hadn't died. I mean, I was working on something entirely different. And, uh, and, then, and then my mother died very, very suddenly, much like Casey's mother dies. And uh, I could never go back to that, to that book. I couldn't even, you know, open the notebook. And, uh, and I, you know, I, I think, I've had time to think about it. And I do think that um, I thought about, I think that my mother's death made me feel so vulnerable, you know, and I, and I think it, it hearkened back or it brought up to the surface another time in my life when I felt so vulnerable, which is, you know, when I was trying to become a writer and, and so incredibly broke and in debt 
and heartbroken and all of those things, you know? So I, I definitely, you know, drew on those emotions and, and then threw in a, a mother's death because I needed a place to put my emotions that I was struggling with as I was writing it. But I think, I think initially that story, you know, this particular story came to the surface because I did feel that there, there was some sort of, um, resonance or echoing that was happening between those two times in my life which is such an interesting thing in itself you know the way the way times in your life do you know kind of circle around and 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 meet each other and and you you feel them and things rise to the surface and um and i kind of seized onto this one <laughs> mm. i think that's such an incredible articulation of um how so many people don't understand that alchemy, I think, until you say it, like you just did, of bringing emotional truths from your life into yeah. your fiction yeah. and, and changing them. They don't look the yeah. same, but they feel the same. Yeah. And so the, the emotional con connectivity to the reader is still, is just so strong. Mm -hmm. So um, it, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's not about autobiography at all. It's about emotional truth, I think. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, Exactly. Yeah. Oh. The autobiography for me, autobiography doesn't doesn't get me there often. You know, uh, I just for whatever reason, it's fiction that gets me there. I, I need to rearrange things and play with them and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, yeah. I think I think you're talking about the limitations of of the facts and yeah. of real life. Um, and it's a good reminder to people that are straddling um sort of you know auto fictional material um you're giving them permission to kind of explode it and and um you know not and be really freed of some of the limitations of the of the facts you're a little frozen now but i think you're there i know we're too are you am i back you're, you're back. back am i back okay um <laughs> Now, Lewis has gone away, but I have a feeling he's hovering, and I think Hello. he... I'm around. I'm here. <laughs> a little tricky. I'm lurking. Oh, there he is. Are you, are you ready to field some questions? We've gotten some great ones. Okay. Yeah? Or no? I, I, I am going to open my door. And, and Maybe opening more. my door will help. Um, this... This has been a just a terrific conversation to listen in on. So thank you guys so much for this. Um, so the first question comes from um, from Zoe, uh, who who says, um, "So I assume you believe, Lily, that Casey will write a second novel, uh, and if that's true, how do you think it will go for her?" Um. I didn't quite hear. If that's true, how do I think it will go? Was that the question? The writing of the second novel. How do you think it will go for for um, for Casey? Oh, I hope it'll go well. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, you know, I think she's in it. I think she's in it for the long haul. So I think she'll do it. I have no no problem with that. And uh, yeah, I'll say no more because I don't want to, you know, ruin the ending for people who haven't read it. And then I think that this, so this next question <clears throat> is from Lynn, um, who, um, and I think that this could be fielded by both of you, um, <clears throat> but she says, um, you write something that you'd like to read, whom do you like to read and why? Um, can, sorry, I, I didn't quite hear that. Can you repeat it again? Oh, just, just sorry. Who, yeah, who do you like to read and why? Oh, yeah. Oh, um, well, let's see. Um, I, I have a few, like, really, you know, people I return to again and again. One is Shirley Hazard. Um, she wrote a book called The Evening of the Holiday and The Transit of Venus. And I really, I mean, that, there, she has, she, her books, I just open them anywhere and I remember why I write, you know. She's, I, she's just brilliant. Same with Virginia Woolf. I, I really love, um, particularly to The Lighthouse. Um, I always keep it on my desk. I have it right over there. Uh, I, I really like Rachel Cusk. I really like Tessa Hadley. I have a, you know, a thing for, for 
uh, British women for whatever reason. I love Jane Gardam, who wrote Old Filth, which is one of my favorite books. Uh, I love Ali Smith. I, I love the, the, the book Autumn so very much. Um, another Brit. So I'll just stick with the, the British women right now. <laughs> Those, they're all very inspiring to me. Thanks for that. And what about you, Susan? Oh, I, I love all the books she said and, <laughs> and more. I do. Um, I also read a lot of creative nonfiction, um, particularly when I'm teaching it. Um, so I'll go on, on, on kicks where I'm doing that. And, and I, I have to say, I did love the Soul Knit memoir. I, I think that was the only book in the last month since we all went inside that I um, was really wrapped by because she gets a first apartment and makes a life solely on her own as a writer. It was really inspiring. Mm -hmm. um, you know what I forgot to say, Lil, is the last time we all gathered, Lewis included, was at Lily's book launch. And yeah. we kept saying, mm -hmm. with, with irony, we kept saying this will be the last gathering. And that was really mm -hmm. weighing heavy on me today. I was really struck by mm -hmm. sort of, um, that fact. And Lily and I have a mutual student who may be on this call who, who wrote an essay about that. And she has the, you're reading in the essay, and she has this wonderful line where we're all like, ha, 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 the last gathering. <laughs> oh, that is so yeah. funny. Anyway, I, I'm, that. I know. I'm sure we have more questions. Um, okay, so here's, here's one from, from Karen, um, who asks, um, and this is for both of you, can you talk about your writing group and how it works when sharing a novel in progress? Do you share each draft as you go? Hmm. Um, so usually the, for the writer who's writing a novel, the writer's group is very much a support group. <laughs> um, there's lots of, you know, rah, rah support and Sometimes you'll, you'll, uh oh, am I unstable again? Um, sometimes you'll, if you dare, you might read a page or two um, and it's called an airing and you, you're you not looking for criticism because you're writing the first draft, right? And, uh, and so you just air it and all the other people can say is that was really nice. <laughs> and that's it. There's no, there's no anything else, you know, it's just a chance for you to, you know, I don't know, just get a little, a, see the light of day, you know, for a few pages. And then, and then when the book is done and you've done many drafts and you're really ready to show it to other people, then you give it to the group. And, you know, three or four or five weeks later, we meet and we discuss it. And, and the writer who's, who's written the book um, is silent and you know everybody goes around and they have a call, whole conversation um, about issues in the book and and the person who wrote the book is just you know taking notes taking notes taking notes and is allowed to ask questions afterwards um, and then and sometimes if there's a, a a really big new draft with lots of changes we might read it again but we we always say that you know we're we're, we're fresh like you get one really good reading and then all the other readings are sort of tainted. And so, you know, you, you try to bring your, your most revised work to the group so you can get a really good reading. Do you, do you want to add to that, Suze? What have I forgotten? That was excellent. That was a primer in our writer's group. That was very good. <laughs> and I, I will say, don't, don't give in and let yourself be read too early. Because when you're in the muck of the first draft, you want desperately to be read early so that your writer's group can tell you, yes, go forward. Um, but then you've lost the fresh eyes. So you, you have to wait. And it's terrible. I can attest. Um, but it's worth it. Fresh eyes are everything. They're gold. So. That's, yeah. That's awesome. It's true. Um, okay, so here's another um, another question from um, from someone with us uh, named Amy, um, who who uh, says that she loved Euphoria and she's been waiting for your next book, which she also loved. Um, and the two seem so vastly different. So she just would love to know how you got from one that must have involved a lot of research to a more intimate subject matter. 
Just the movement well, from one you know, to another. Uh, yeah, it wasn't. It wasn't. Um, it wasn't fluid in that way. I really tried to avoid writing a personal, intimate narrative next after Euphoria. I really enjoyed all the research. I enjoyed um, what was required to make up um, scenes and dialogues and scenarios and descriptions. I mean, all, you can do all the research in the world, but uh, nothing is gonna, you, know, you just, you, you can't really find the, all the details that you need to, to write a book like Euphoria. And I really love that. I loved the challenge to my imagination and I loved going on book tour and not having to talk about myself. All I had to talk about was Margaret Mead and that was really fun. Um, and, and so I had a couple of ideas and, and um, I embarked on one and it didn't work and then I embarked on the other after months and months of research and then that's when my mom died, which I think, you know, that is why this novel um, came about and why it is so personal and why I wrote something so much more intimate than I ever planned to write. Um, it's just because I was in that state where I couldn't do anything else. Like, like I, I was just like kind of raw and open and that's what came out on the page. Mm. Uh, <clears throat> there's another question here. Um, <clears throat> this is from Karen. Um, and she says, it's often said that first novels are the most autobiographical, yet this novel seems like it might be your most directly autobiographical. Seems like it must be. Um, could you have mm -hmm. written this novel, say, 10 to 15 years ago? Um, or did you specifically avoid writing autobiographically then? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I, I could not have written this novel 10 or 15 years ago. You know, I really needed the distance um, from, from, you know, those, that time in my life that was so hard. I think that time in my life really scared me. I mean, I, you know, I write about Casey's anxiety. I had a lot of anxiety and I had never had that before. And I'd never had panic attacks before. I'd never had insomnia before all of that was really scary to me. And it's taken me a long time to kind of look back at that without fear and without fear that it would come back and, you know, or that it would haunt me or all kinds of things like that, you know? And so I think that's part of the reason. Um, but also just, I didn't feel that removed from it until now. Um, and I, yeah, it's, it's funny. I mean, I, I don't, um, I, I think with every book, um, I pull in, you know, a lot of my experiences, all of my imagination, everything I, you know, I've read and heard and I kind of like, you know, put it in a big Yahtzee cup and shake it up and, and then roll it. And then, you know, that is, uh, that is the book and 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 it kind of the the proportions are different every time um and you just you just never know what's gonna happen you know before you start in that's great thank you um <clears throat> there was another question about just um about you know the re kind of the reaction to the novel um that you're feeling um and and have you like experienced different reactions from different demographics or different genders? You know, I, this is a question about like, what have you heard from, from folks in response to this book? I've heard from a lot of writers, which is yeah. such a really relief and, and really gratifying because you know, you're, it's a little bit like hearing from anthropologists when I wrote Euphoria, you know, it was, that was such a relief because I was so scared about their response to it. Um, and, and even though I am a writer and you would think I would feel comfortable writing about wow. being a writer, I, you know, I, I had no idea how other people experienced being a writer and I, I could have gotten blow back and, you know, kind of, it's not like that. And, blah, 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 you know, and, um, and I really haven't, I, I've been really, um, I've been 
so surprised and and um, just I don't know again like back to connection you know I just I felt so connected to to people who who responded to the book and and um, and I what's been really great is even though I've you know, I had the book come out March 3rd and we all went inside within a couple of weeks and all the bookstores, most of the bookstores in the country shut their doors and, you know, a lot of them have gone online, thank God, and, um, and have really adapted. But um, it, it, you know, and that, that's been frustrating to, to not be selling books in airports and stores and all the places. And so obviously, you know, the sales are not as high. Um, but people have time to write me. I mean, you know, I've heard from so many more people than I've ever like times, you know, 25 of any other book or all of my other books put together. And, and that's been really nice. Like people are really communicating right now. And, and, uh, and I've been so grateful for that. Yeah. I, I, um, I, I loved reading the book. I loved writing you a letter about the book afterwards because I just felt so excited to write, uh, you know, after reading your book and I wanted to share that with you. Um, so I love that. I, mean, that that I love it when people write and say that they're inspired to write yeah. or to go back. I've gotten a number of, I'm going to go back and finish that novel I started, you know, and I'm just like, yes, yes. That's exactly what I want you to feel. <laughs> Sorry to cut you off. No, no, no. That's, that's fine. Um, <laughs> There's um, uh, another question that just came in from um, from Peggy, um, and this is about just point of view choices. She says, when you write your first draft, is it always in first person, or does the point of view come to you later? Do you you know do you change points of view um, while you're while you're working on a project ever? I often question the point of view. Um, I can't remember what this started out as because I flipped back and forth a number of times. You know. Um, so yeah, I, I, it's rare that I know that it's going to be one. I, I, and I also, same with tense, present tense, past tense, you know, I would prefer to write in past tense, but um, I have a couple of novels, this one included, where the present really helps me, you know, creates an immediacy and um, that I, that I think is important. And um, yeah, I, I, I go back back and forth until, until I just finally know. And usually I'm playing with the first page. I, I don't, you know, I'm, I'm usually just trying to hear how the first page sounds, you know, one way or another. Well, thank you. Thank you both so much for, um, for spending the time with us. And thank you everyone else for, for um, joining us on this Zoom um, meeting. Uh, the uh, the library misses you. Um, we all miss the library, uh, but we'll uh, we will we will ride again soon. Um, but thank you, Susan, so much. Thank you, Lily. Uh, thank and, you. Uh, thank you, Suze. Thank, thank you, you Lil. And thank you all for tuning in. I'm grateful. Yeah. We'll uh, we'll be back at it next month with Fook Tran and Jed Coffin on May twentieth. So looking forward to that too. Thank you guys so much. Bye. All right, thanks. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye.